So good morning, everyone. I'm Christina with Forge Survivorship Center, and we're here today to talk with Andriana Capers about genetic testing. Um, and so now I am going to turn the conversation over to her and give her an option or the opportunity to introduce herself and tell us a little bit about what she does. Well, good morning, everyone. I am Andriana and want to say thank you so, so much for the invite. So glad to be here and Happy New Year um, again to everyone. Um, we've made it to 2021, which has been such a crazy, tumultuous year, but happy, blessed New Year um, to everyone. Gosh, um, to talk about myself, it's not something I normally do. <laughs> So um, I'm Andriana, and I work with patients that are at a high risk for hereditary cancer. And working with those patients is definitely not a job. Um, I wouldn't even say it's a career, it's a passion um, that I have. Love, love, love what I do. Um, I look at it um, really as, a, as an honor. Um, to work with God's people during this chapter of their lives and to be a part of that. Um, well, I guess I would say what started my journey into looking into counseling or seeing that as a missed piece within the medical field was personal losses, um, not necessarily from cancer, um, but from other illnesses, my sister, my father, um, that passed away and definitely always give so much thanks to my parents for impacting my life because they are just the best. <laughs> but um, when losing, you know, those close family members like that, for me, I was a lot younger and saw that that educational piece was missing. You know, you can give a person a diagnosis, but if they don't understand fully what the diagnosis means, what their resources are, um, prognosis, things of that nature, a huge chunk is missing. So that would, I would definitely say, began my journey um, of the counseling aspect. Um, then once I came to good old UAB here in Birmingham, became a part of community outreach, working with my church's breast cancer ministry of virtue, um, began to see the need within the community of resources that were needed, um, especially within the African American community to have a true understanding of what mammograms are for, why we need those mammograms. You know, if um, the physician says, okay, I need you to go have a mammogram done, but you don't know why you're having the mammogram, exactly the details of the mammogram, what is this going to show, how is it going to help me, will it not help me? It's a slew of questions that can come, you know, but for us that understand what mammograms are, we don't look at it as deep as that. So again, there's that educational piece for me that showed once more that, you know, some patients or some individuals just didn't know about. Um, when I see a patient, I don't just look at them as patient Jane or John Doe. Jane or John Doe belongs to someone. Um, that is someone's sister, brother, spouse, siblings, you know, they belong to someone. And I think if more people in healthcare will always view that, which, you know, healthcare is awesome and great, um, treat them the way you want your family members treated. So I always keep that in mind um, when working with that patient because they have a link to someone and I'm just an additional link within that relationship. So um, that would be, I guess, the background of how I got into counseling, long story short, um, you know, why I have the passion for it that I do have for it. So with um, high risk counseling, we're working with those patients that have either been diagnosed with cancer or have a um, very strong family history um, of hereditary cancer. So not to just say cancers in general, but those hereditary cancers. So patients that have um, been diagnosed at an early age, 50 years old or younger, uh, would be something that's like a red flag or types of patients that we would work with, strong family histories. Um, you may see a family history of a lot of breast cancer, ovarian cancer, um, which is categorized as HBOC, hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, um, to see why, you know, are so many of those family members, you know, why do they have cancer? Um, not all cancer is hereditary. 65% of cancers are sporadic, 15 to 25% are familial, so it's in the family. Um, and then only 5 to 10% of cancers are hereditary. So that's that genetic piece um, there 
that we're looking at. So in a nutshell, that's kind of what high risk counseling um, entails. Yeah. Thank you so much um, for just sharing your passion. And it's so, I get excited when other people are excited. Um, so it's so <laughs> exciting to hear you be excited about that. And truly, until you and I talked, I had not even heard of the term of high-risk counseling. Um, and mm -hmm. I think that's such an incredibly important field um, that anyone who's experiencing cancer should, should be aware of and um, for themselves and their family members. Um, but moving on from the kind of what you're talking about, that niche, like five to 10% of hereditary cancers, can you explain to us in layman's terms, what is genetic testing and how does it work and why? Yeah, let's start with that. Okay. So yeah. genetic testing um, is the sequencing of DNA from a sample that we collect from a patient. That sample can, um, was either blood or saliva. And so the sample is sent off to a genetics laboratory for genetic sequencing. Genetic sequencing is trying to identify if there is a genetic mutation or change within that patient or that individual's DNA. So if a um, gene is shown as pathogenic or clinically significant, meaning positive, then the test results can come back in either three, one of three ways. Um, those three ways are a positive, meaning there was a clinically significant mutation found, also negative of the genes tested, the genes tested, that that patient did not test positive for either of those genes, and also um, it can show as a VUS, which is a variant of uncertain significance. So VUS is a little tricky. <laughs> So with the BUS, it means that yes, there was a change found, but at this time, there isn't enough information or evidence to classify that variant as benign or as pathogenic. That's amazing that you can get all of that from potentially saliva. Yes. <laughs> um, that is just <laughs> incredible. Um, uh -huh. And so are there different types of genetic testing like that someone would go through? Yes, the um, two types of genetic testing we can go over are actual targeted single site testing and panel testing. So with targeted single site testing, for an example, if there is a known mutation within one's family line. So say, for instance, um, we're talking about breast cancer, we'll use BRCA. Um, for an example. So if someone's mother or father, because men can also have a BRCA mutation, test positive um, for BRCA as having that mutation, there is a 50% chance that their first generation also has that mutation. That would mean um, that patients, parents, siblings, or children, because those actual genes that are tested are autosomal dominant, meaning we only need one copy um, from either your mother or your father in order to um, have that gene inherited. So with that being said, if you know there is a BRCA mutation that is present, then we can do specific targeted testing for that one gene, so single site. The other type of testing is panel testing. So panel testing is testing a variety or various genes within one test. So single site is testing only one gene. Panel testing is testing several genes within one test to look for certain syndromes. Again, HBLC or Lynch syndrome. So you're um, testing for other genes, not just BRCA. So mm -hmm. in that example, we would test for BRCA only for the single site because we know there is a mutation within that family line. But with the panel test, we would you know, check for BRCA, check two, other genes as well. And so that would be the difference between the two types of um, testing, targeted single site testing and also panel testing. Thank you for explaining that. Um, why would, you know, you've worked with so many different people who have had cancer, who have had family members who have had cancer um, and who are kind of maybe nervous about genetic testing. And you spoke to this a little bit in your introduction, but I'm wondering if you can speak to it more. Why would someone want to get genetic testing? And why would they maybe want to do one type of genetic testing or the other one that you mentioned? Okay. Um, patients who are referred um, or want to have genetic testing, again, are those patients that meet criteria 
to mm-hmm. have genetic testing done because, you know, even though someone has cancer, they don't automatically qualify to have genetic testing done. So those that meet the criteria, um, going over those again, um, diagnosed at a young age, 50 years or younger, having multiple family members or multiple diagnoses within an individual, someone having breast cancer twice, rare cancers, those are like such as ovarian, pancreatic. Um, cancers of that nature would be reasons why someone would want to look into having genetic counseling done and testing to see if there is a link with the reasoning of why there's so much cancer within their family or to answer the why's. Again, the educational piece um, of why they, you know, were diagnosed with cancer, you know, age 50 or younger. Um, and, and hopefully that will help, you know, with those answers to help with their treatment and medical management guidelines as well. Um, the reason why someone would choose single site testing as opposed to panel testing, once they come in for the counseling, we um, do a lot of digging. <laughs> so whereas asking questions about your maternal and your paternal side of the family, because you have genes from both sides, mommy and daddy. And so if there is um, cancer, you know, on one side of the family, we know mom or dad had that specific gene mutation, then that patient may want to consider only having single site because again, that gene is autosomal dominant. It only has to come from one parent for inheritance. So that way that individual can know if they inherited that positive mutation from their parent. In that instance, if it's a child that's having genetic um, testing done. Panel testing would come from if there is cancer vastly on both sides of the family. For instance, if you see a lot of breast cancer, ovarian cancer on mom's side, then dad's side, there's a lot of colon cancer. We may want to look at doing a panel because, you know, gosh, we've got both sides, you may not have that genetic mutation from the mom's side, but you could have a mutation from the father's side. So that is why we would look at both panel testing, single site testing, and getting all of that information during the pre-counseling session. Because you have a pre-counseling session, if the patient decides to move forward, genetic testing, which is the sample collection, and then afterwards, the post genetic counseling session to go over the results to make sure there's a full conglomerate of understanding um, Mm -hmm. of genetic testing and counseling. Absolutely. And would you still potentially recommend panel testing if one side of the family had some of these more serious potential hereditary cancers and even if the other side of the family had maybe a more common cancer? I don't know if that's the right language to use or not, but is it the camp, does it matter what kind of cancer that is in either family lineage that would qualify you for panel testing? It does. Um, When the cancers are hereditary, um, for instance, you know, we know about breast cancer. So we have syndromes that we can look at, such as HBOC, hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndromes. Um, So with that, there are various genes that have a high risk to breast cancer and ovarian cancer. So that could be um, the BRCA test or an actual panel test testing only BRCA. Um, You could have also patients with colon cancer, um, oh, not ovarian cancer, but um, uterine cancer, different things, brain cancer, different things like that, pancreatic. And so that will look at a different type of hereditary cancer panel test. So it's based upon the type of cancers that are within the family of which type panel is chosen. Got it, awesome. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, I'm learning so much. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. So you've talked really passionately about your experience as a high-risk counselor. And I'm wondering if you'd be willing to share any meaningful stories that you've been a part of as your, as your role as a high-risk counselor. Mm, several, several, several. You have time. <laughs> um, I would say, gosh, meaningful stories. Um, first one I can think of was a young lady coming in having genetic testing done. She was possibly, I would say, maybe in her 20s or so, she tested positive um, for a genetic mutation and was really, really bummed out about it. You know, she felt like she was, you know, labeled. Um, What about having children? You know, all the things that would go through your mind, you know, because knowing that those genes are autosomal dominant, 
that gene could be passed on to her offspring. Mm -hmm. And um, just talking with her, you know, going over the pros also about genetic testing and just saying, okay, let's look at some of the positives, you know, from knowing that you are um, positive and have a clinically significant mutation. Um, those things are increasing um, surveillance screening. So instead of just, you know, going for your um, annual physical and having a mammogram, you know, once a, once a year, they can also add MRIs mm -hmm. as well for screenings. And they space those out, you know, most times like six months apart. So therefore, every six months, you're having some type of screening done. Um, gosh, so many people are definitely afraid of cancer, um, you know, just don't want to hear the word cancer, and would love to get screened every month if they could to stay on top of it. And her sister was a part of that um, actual counseling session. And she was like, well, I wish I could get, you know, screened every six months and now you can and I can't. So that was kind of a lighter moment for her mm -hmm. to have her see that, you know, by her having the knowledge and the education and knowing that she does have that positive mutation, that she now can have those increased screenings and how that can help her. Mm -hmm. So I would say that is definitely, um, you know, meaningful. Um, a lot of patients definitely are so afraid of the, the actual result because it is nerve wracking because you don't know, but just making sure that those patients, you know, have an understanding of what those results mean and how it can help them and as a tool and as a resource is very, very important. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that. And that's something I think you and I had spoken on a little bit before others got on the call, but just mm -hmm trying to find the positives and a positive result. Um, <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's tricky, but that just is such important work. Um, what else do you want people to know about the opportunities to do genetic testing or about high-risk counselors? And how would you even find a high-risk counselor if you think that you qualify to talk with one? Well, definitely speak with your physician, um, your primary care doctor, ladies, your OBGYNs, you know, find out about your family history, not just your mother, but your mother and your father's side of the family, you know, find out if there um, are diagnoses of cancer, if there is a diagnosis of cancer, how old um, were your family members when they were diagnosed, um, what stage, if there, if there is a stage there, but definitely the age of diagnosis, the type of cancer, and inform your doctors about that so that they can look into having you referred to um, have genetic testing and counseling done. Um, once you're referred, you'll meet with someone that will definitely let you know if you meet criteria, but um, definitely it starts with letting your physician know, knowing your history, your family history, and letting your physician know about that family history. Absolutely, that's very helpful. Um, and finally, how what, what else do you want people to know about <laughs> genetic testing? Um, what else you, are some barriers that someone might experience or kind of come up to that would maybe scare them from doing it or, you know, they may not know still? How, what else would you recommend to folks? Right. Um, some of the um, things about genetic testing, not everyone, even if their doctor says to them, okay, I want you to have genetic testing done. I can call them on the phone to, you know, get them scheduled and may not hear anything sometime for months or weeks, which is, you know, not unheard of because they have to be mentally ready to have genetic testing done. And I say mentally ready because what are the results? If that result is positive, would that send them into a depressive state? Will that make them anxious the rest of their lives wondering, okay, each time they go to the doctor, they're going to say they found cancer. They've seen a lump, they've seen something. You know, how is that going to affect their quality um, of life. So a person has to be definitely mentally ready, understand the full pros and cons of genetic testing and be ready to take that journey. So we want to make sure that they're fully informed before they make that decision and that they're comfortable to know what those test results can come back as. It can also be for a patient who is looking for a positive result because there's so much cancer within their family. It can you know, go either way. And they're coming in for genetic testing, they meet criteria, um, actually have had you know, that to happen. Um, a patient had cancer, their twin sister had cancer, their mother and their grandmother. So they're like gun ho like, yes, let's do this genetic testing. I know there is um, a mutation within the family line and it comes back negative. So that was a bummer for that patient because they still don't have the answer 
that they thought that genetic testing would give them. So it's preparing that patient to know what those results can come back as and to be ready to live with that actual test result going forward. Mm-hmm. Um, you mentioned earlier that you know when you get the sample of saliva or blood back, what you're saying is in this particular strand, you did not see any no, uh, mutation or something like that. Um, do people get tested twice ever? Um, is there a chance that maybe the second test could pick up something the first test didn't? Well, the, D, um, the sequencing um, of the DNA is very, very accurate. Um, when a patient may get a second test would be like an update test is what we would call that. So remember, we're testing um, a panel. So with a panel test, we're testing specific genes. We're not testing every single gene in the body because there's no way to do that. <laughs> there is no test that does that. But within a panel testing, um, say again for HBLC, there may be particular genes um, Um, that we know again at this time that have that link to having a high risk of cancer. Well, um, of course, as research and as science progresses, they may add other genes to that panel. Mm -hmm. So remember, we're only testing that panel. So if they add more genes to that panel, that patient can come back and have update testing to see if they test positive or negative or VUS, that variant, again, of uncertain significance for those new genes that have been added to the panel. So that would constitute some patients that may have a second test done. Um, I feel like, you know, I know that I am showing um, my ignorance to this in my questions, but thank you so much for answering them um, because they're this is a whole new, it's a, it's a whole new thing for a lot of people, um, and I'm in that included, so thank you. Absolutely. Um, I always tell, you know, patients when they come in, it's a, it's a lot to take in. There are no crazy questions um, when it comes to your health. It just shows that you're interactive, you're connected, you want to know, and that, that's the best way to be. And if I don't have the answer, I'll go find the answer so that we can, you know, get there together. And, you know, there's never, ever a crazy question when it comes to your health. Never. So that's the educational piece for me again, you know, not to want patients or anyone to be hesitant of asking a question because, you know, to be like, oh gosh, I can't believe I don't know the answer to that. Well, you can miss so much by not answering that question. And again, honing in, you know, listening, looking at those cues of um, not having a full understanding um, of what's going on, of the diagnosis, of the prognosis, what it means. And again, just listening out for that, because again, that person has a link or relationship to someone else, that someone's mother, brother, sister, some type of relationship. So again, just for me, not wanting to miss that opportunity and always letting patients know um, that, you know, there at St. Vincent's Bruno Cancer Center, we're there for you throughout the entire journey. Um, mm-hmm. So if they need to call back, you know, after they, they're they done with their um, radiation treatments and they're cancer free, if they have questions, definitely we're still there for them. We don't just leave. Kind of like family. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Absolutely. Um, Well, I know, I think I keep saying this. Is there anything else you would want to leave us with today? That's actually all of my questions. Um, But yeah, do you have any kind of closing thoughts or comments for our recorded section today? Um, I'm not sure just to answer any questions that anyone may have um, to make clarification. If something I said didn't make sense, like, gosh, that was a ramble she just did. I'm kind of known for that. So... (laughs) Uh, just just to um, an, you know, answer any questions that anyone may have, and I'm just so thankful for the invite to be a part of the Coffee Conversation with Forge. 